Sara. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pepa Alvarez, as Sara said, and I'm one of the co-editors of Correspondent Voices, Volume 14, along with my colleagues who are also with us this evening, Tere Paniagua and probably Kathy Everly a little bit later. We would like to thank you all for joining us tonight as we welcome poet Angelo Nestore. Each year, Point of Contact invites poets from around the world to publish in our annual po uh, poetry journal, Correspondent Voices. With this, our poets also take part in our poetry reading series, Cruel April, in celebration of National Poetry Month. We would like to thank our sponsors who have made this program possible. Syracuse University's College of Arts and Science, the New York State Council of the Arts, Syracuse University's Coalition of Museum and Arts Centers, Central New York Arts, Syracuse University's Department of Languages, Literatures and Linguistics, and Poets and Writers. We also like to honor and acknowledge the Jude Nocioni people on whose ancestral lands point of contact now stands. Angelo Nestore is a poet, performer, and translator. They were born in Italy, but live in Malaga in the south of Spain. They are director of the poetry publisher Le Traversal and co-direct the Irreconciliables International Poetry Festival. They are the author of several poetry books. The second one, Actos Impuros, Impure Acts in his English Translation, won the prestigious Hyperion Poetry Award in Spain. Their third collection, Agase Mi Voluntad, won the well-known Emilio Prados Award. This evening's English translations will be read by uh, his uh, author, Orlando Ocampo. Orlando is Associate Professor of Spanish at Lemoyne College, and he is also a contributing translator of correspondent to Correspondent Voices, Volume 14. Welcome, Angelo and Orlando. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm a Am I supposed to switch to Spanish or no? You can if you choose, that's perfectly fine. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much to everyone for letting me be here and, and for being so caring and with me. And I'm really, really happy to be part of, the, of your program, this cruel episode. So thank you so much, Sarah, Pepa and everybody. Y, y, Ahora me dirijo eh, en español, eso para, para daros una vez más las gracias. Y, y voy a empezar a leer unos poemas de, de Hágase mi voluntad, de este libro que, que publiqué el año pasado. Ya ha pasado un año, aunque claro, con la pandemia ya el tiempo es relativo. Y voy a empezar leyendo justamente un poema que tiene que ver con el tiempo. Tiene que ver con el tiempo porque... Eh, la, las pocas veces, ¿no? Por, como justamente había dicho Pepa, la, vivo en España, pero soy de origen italiano. ¿no? Entonces, mi familia está en Italia, vive en Italia, en el sur. Y las pocas veces que voy, yo solo tengo a mi madre porque soy, no tengo hermanas ni hermanos, ni, y mi padre falleció cuando tenía 11 años. Entonces, cada vez que voy, hago todo lo que diga mi madre para hacerla feliz. Eh, entonces, cuando recuerdo que la última vez que estuve allí, ya hace casi dos años por la pandemia, era verano y mi madre me dijo, bueno, vamos al cementerio. No era algo que a mí me, realmente me llamaba mucho la atención, pero claro, por supuesto, le dije que sí. Y mientras estábamos allí, eh, me dijo, ah, pues mira, ahí está tu nicho. Y yo como no sabía si darle las gracias o sabía si... Pero claro, mi madre me proyectaba allí. Mi madre proyectaba mi, el ángelo en Italia. Y yo cuando vi ese nicho, cuando vi ese, ese espacio, dije... Me pregunté realmente de, de dónde soy, ¿no? ¿Quién soy realmente? ¿Volverá mi cuerpo a Italia o no? O mi madre aún no ha entendido que yo realmente ya no formo parte ¿no? De, de, de este entorno. Y a raíz de ese 
eh, empecé a pensar también sobre el tema de la identidad y escribí un poema que se llama Insepulto, que os voy a leer ahora mismo. Mi madre compró un nicho en Italia y me dijo, aquí descansaremos los dos con tu padre. Y de repente imagino su cráneo apoyado sobre mi cráneo, refugiado en la madera del árbol nacer y le sonrío. Su esperanza me roza como una caricia para que un día deje España y vuelva a la suya. Es una promesa de amor eterno. Pienso en mi madre, en mi padre y en mí, convertidos en polvo, una familia sin descendencia mediterránea, unida en la muerte como nunca lo estuvo en vida. Y algún día, algún día el conserje barrerá las flores podridas, nos dejará desabrigados frente al mundo, mirará el nicho e intuirá nuestro amor en la foto familiar con fondo blanco, entre tanto hueso desnudo, igual de seco, igual de blanco. Si lo pienso, un nicho es la utopía perfecta, sin hombres o mujeres, todos extranjeros. Guardamos un mundo ideal dentro de nuestros huesos, pero tan lejano. La tumba es el modelo de familia definitivo. Deberíamos meter todos la cabeza en un nicho hasta que por fin deje de dolernos el mundo. Uh... Okay, um, before I uh, read the uh, translation I did of this poem, it was one of the two poems that decided me to, uh, to uh, take out the translation, take out the job when, when Pepa offer, would you like to do this? Uh, because in a way it speaks to me too. What Angelo was uh, saying is that, although he was born in Italy and he, his mother is still there, He has been living in Spain for, for a long while and he goes back uh, every once in a while. And the last time he was there uh, he, to see his mother because his uh, um, father passed away a few years ago, it's just the two of us. And the mother uh, asked him to accompany her to the cemetery, which was a big surprise for <laughs> Angelo because he didn't know uh, why. Um, this invitation. And once there, he, she showed her uh, a niche that she had uh, purchased and said, look, uh, that one over there is ours. And so Angelo was uh, taken aback, didn't you know what to say, whether to thank her or not. But that, that led him to, to think about this, uh, uh, his identity, which uh, has been split now uh, between Italy and Spain, where he has resided uh, for, for a while now. So, unburied. My mother bought a niche in Italy and told me, here we will rest the two of us with your father. And all of a sudden, I imagine her, sc her skull leaning on mine sheltered in the trunk of the tree that watched us at birth, and I smile at her. Her hope brushes against me like a caress, so that one day I may leave Spain and return. Hers is a promise of eternal love. I think about my father, my, my mother, my father, and me, turned to dust, a family without descendants, Mediterranean, united in death like it never was in life. Someday the caretaker will sweep the rotten flowers, will leave us exposed. He will look at the niche and will sense our love in the studio family portrait among so many naked bones, just as dry, just as white. If I think about it, about it a niche is the perfect utopia, without men or women, all foreigners. We keep an ideal world inside us, 
in our bones, but so far away. The tomb is the definitive model of a family. We should all stick our heads in a niche until the world stops hurting us. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Orlando, por contar todo y por la magnífica lectura. Este, este libro, en el fondo, acá sin voluntad, es un poco una, la continuación y una puesta en tela de juicio de mi anterior libro, que era Actos Impuros, que tuve la oportunidad de, de publicar Justamente en Nueva York se publicó en Intolent Books, una editorial de Brooklyn. Y en, en, en Impure Acts, eh, en Actos Impuros, hablaba desde la visión, desde la, quizá también desde la ingenuidad, la capacidad de poder crear una, o pensar en una nueva... Eh, una nueva raza ¿no? de, de, de hombres, una ra nueva raza humana, ¿no? una nueva forma de abordar la identidad, pero de una forma un poco naif. Y me he dado cuenta de, con Hágase mi voluntad, que era necesario una, una reflexión en torno a la identidad y sobre todo a lo que ha implicado eh, la educación o la socialización que yo he tenido como, como hombre durante muchos años. Porque hay un concepto que en España, por ejemplo, se está, se está hablando mucho de él, que supongo que también en, en Estados Unidos, el eh, concepto de nuevas masculinidades, eh, que me parece en realidad un poco peligroso, porque parece que con este término, con este new delante de la palabra, estamos borrando de un plumazo siglos y siglos de opresión, creyendo que sea posible volver a empezar sin reflexionar una vez más sobre, en torno a todo lo que, lo que ha significado ¿no? y lo que significa ser hombre. Porque cuando hablamos, por ejemplo, de cuestiones de género, siempre el, los sujetos son la persona LGBT, las mujeres, pero nunca se cuestiona ¿no? a los hombres. Siempre los hombres se dan, ¿no? están en su pedestal. Entonces, para mí la literatura tiene también un una componente político y, y, uno, y para mí el, el olvido o el no olvido en concreto es política. Y por eso eh, quería recoger una, un hecho eh, histórico realmente, no político, de la actualidad en española del 2018, si no me equivoco, que es la manada, es decir, cuando un grupo de hombres en España eh, violan a una, a una mujer. Y evidentemente es emblemático eh, porque evidente, desgracia, desgraciadamente pasa muy a menudo. ¿no? Entonces escribí este poema que se llama Manada. Enciende el, el, or Perdona. Enciende el ordenador y me asalta la urgencia de borrar el historial de mi estirpe. La pantalla exhibe la leche de los héroes, el rostro de quien se creyó Dios por costumbre, el aullido insistente de todas las manadas, agarrando la historia con una mano, bajándose con la otra la bragueta. La historia que resbala, que se ensucia, la historia que asoma justo en medio del escroto, que golpea el mundo, que lo hace añicos. Gracias, Angelo. Uh, Angelo uh, says that uh, this book, uh, uh, My Will Be Done, Uh, followed um, his previous book, uh, Impure Acts, which was actually published in the United States, and led him to, um, to, he wanted to be able to think and to create a, sort of a new race of men. And 
was a reflection on identity. Um, in Spain, like uh, in the United States, there has been uh, a new concept uh, floating around, which is the idea of new masculinities. And for Angelo, this is a little bit dangerous because it implies the erosion of many centuries of oppression uh, because it concentrates more on uh, women and, um, and sort of leaves out. It sort of uh, uh, forgets what it means to, to be a man. And for him, uh, poetry involves uh, a, a political commitment. It's, uh, it, has a, it has a political component and that's why he wanted to think of this poem, for example, as a, a resistance to oblivion, not to forget what has happened to uh, men um, in history. And he took uh, the um, occasion of this episode, which uh, uh, took part in, in, in Spain, in Caen, uh, several years ago, five or six now, uh, called uh, the Manada, uh, in which um, a group of, of five men, which included uh, a Guardia Civil, a policeman, mm. uh, raped uh, a young woman um, in the afternoon and during the Feast of uh, San Fermin. And what that led to and how initially the uh, the courts uh, only instituted a minor um, uh, punishment on this man until uh, a lot of people uh, really rose up against it. And uh, finally, it was brought to trial again. Uh, like um, Angela says, unfortunately, it happens uh, over and over again, not only in Spain, it happens here. Actually, I was just reading in Argentina, in, in southern Argentina, in the province of Chubut, there is also called the Manada from Chubut, in which three women, three guys raped a young woman. And uh, the efforts, uh, one of them, one of the guys was uh, related to, I think, uh, an ex uh, politician. I don't know if it was a governor or a senator. So they are still fighting for justice over there. So um, he wrote this poem, Manada, which for those who um, don't know, it's the word for wolf pack. Manada. I turn on the computer and I'm struck by the urgency to erase the history of my lineage. The screen shows the heroes come. The face of who thought of himself as a god out of habit. The insistent howling of all the wolf packs. Grabbing history with one hand while opening their fly with the other. The history that slides off, that soils itself. The history that pokes its face right in the middle of the scrotum that hits the word that shatters it to pieces. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Orlando. Y un poco sobre la, la estela ¿no? de todo, de, de, de ese contexto. También mm, es, he estado reflexionando sobre cómo se llega a eso y también cómo se genera el deseo. Eh, hay un tema que es un tema bastante tabú, que es el tema de la pornografía, pero realmente también la pornografía, en cierto modo, es un reflejo de cómo el deseo masculino se construye, se genera y, en cierto modo, luego se pervierte. ¿no? Es curioso, pero justamente después de este caso, de esta, eh, de esta violación tan mediática, eh, en la versión española de una página web mmm, porno, eh, la palabra manada, San Fermín, 
y violación eran tendencia, eran las palabras más buscadas. Entonces, había muchas personas buscando un vídeo de una violación o quizá el mismo vídeo u otro vídeo ¿no? que reconstruyeran esta violación para excitarse. Y allí escribí este poema. El niño adolescente que abre Porntube en una ventana de incógnito no está pensando en la muerte. Pulsa el ratón con insistencia para que se cargue el vídeo y espera. Abre los muslos inmaculados, se toca con la mano izquierda. En la pantalla una mujer gime en bucle rodeada de cinco hombres, mantiene los ojos cerrados. Pero en eso, el niño no se fija. Con él crece el número de visitas. El niño suma a otro niño, a miles de niños, su soledad. Acepta las cookies con la fe ciega de quien acepta la Eucaristía. Se siente parte de una comunidad, de un todo, un solo ojo polifemo, una navaja que penetra a la misma mujer. El niño que abre Pornhub en una ventana de incógnito y que vea a una mujer rodeada de cinco hombres y que no está pensando en la muerte y que no ve en esa escena un entierro, algún día me venderá el pan, me pedirá la documentación, me llevará a casa en el autobús, firmará sentencias, chasqueará los dedos, deseará escupirme cuando me oiga hablar de mí en femenino. Me mirará siempre, siempre, con ese destello de navaja en el código binario de sus ojos. This uh, event, this act, um, uh, also led Angela to, to think about, uh, on the one hand, how is male desire generated but also how it becomes perverted. And uh, he mentions uh, the, um, that uh, in the uh, Spanish version of uh, Porn 2, um, uh, it became um, uh, the words uh, manada, San Fermin, and, and rape uh, became trends and received uh, many hits. And a lot of people, a lot of men, use that to um, become excited, to excite themselves. So uh, Angelo, uh, thinking about that, wrote this poem called Porn Tube. The kid that opens Porn Tube, a port tube window incognito, is not thinking about death. He clicks the mouse insistently so that it will load up the video and waits. He spreads his immaculate, immaculate thighs, touches himself with the left hand. On the screen, a woman groans again and again, surrounded by five men. She keeps her eyes closed, but the boy doesn't notice that. With him, the number of visits grows. A boy adds to another boy, to thousands of boys, his loneliness. He accepts the cookies with the blind faith of those who take communion. He feels part of a community, of a whole, a one-eyed polyphemus, a razor that penetrates the same woman. The boy who opens a porn tube window incognito and who sees a woman surrounded by five men and who is not thinking about death and does not see a burial in that scene, someday, someday will sell me bread, will ask me for my driver's license, will take me home in a bus, will sign death sentences, snaps his fingers, will want to spit on me when he hears people talking about me in the feminine. He will always look at me with that razor sparkle in his eyes 
binary code. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Orlando. También os quiero decir que, bueno, que eso no, aún no se lo he dicho a nadie, ¿eh? pero bueno, me, pare, me hace ilusión deciroslo a, aquí a vosotras, vosotros, que estoy trabajando también en una forma híbrida de, o sea, de convertir estos poemas en algo musical sin abandonar la poesía. Y lo estoy haciendo en inglés. Y este, este poema en concreto va a ser uno de ellos. Así que, bueno, en algún momento, a través de Pepa, lo mandaré. Vale. Eh, voy a intentar saltar un poco de poemas porque veo que, se, que, que hablo mucho. Y voy a... Voy a, a también un poco, vuelvo atrás en el tiempo, vuelvo a mi infancia, eh, a ese momento, hay, hay un momento muy importante en mi, en mi vida, porque yo de, de pequeña era monaguillo, ¿no? era un monaguillo, <risa> yo recuerdo que, que mi madre me decía, bueno, si eres monaguillo, pues te compro la Nintendo, que bueno, era la Nintendo, la primera Nintendo, o sea que ya se delata un poco mi edad, pero bueno. Eh, entonces, eh, recuerdo ese momento en el cual eh, el cura ya tiene otro, un papel casi, ¿no? De, de forjar tu identidad, forjar tu masculinidad, decirte lo que tienes lo que, y lo que no tienes que hacer y dónde está el pecado y hacia dónde no tienes que ir. Y... Y recuerdo, no, no sé si, si eso pasa también en Estados Unidos, con, ¿no? o, bueno, porque en España no creo. Los moraguillos en Italia llevan un traje blanco, como, como si fuera un traje como de un cura, igual, pero blanco, que representa justamente, al ser niños, la inocencia. Y, y yo imaginaba ese traje blanco que llevaba, yo me sentía mal, porque lo, lo imaginaba lleno de manchas, ¿no? Por, por, por cómo estaba forjando yo mi deseo con respecto a lo que me decía el cura. Catequesis se llama este poema. Mira, por ejemplo, la boca del niño que sorbe el néctar de una sandía y te ofrece su sonrisa mellada. Observa el jugo que gotea sobre el cuello de su camisa blanca como se estiran sus comisuras ante el sabor dulce y oculto de la fruta. Y fíjate entonces que no le salpica la culpa todavía, aunque note en la piel el roce húmedo y pringoso de la mancha. Así pasa su vida sin nombrarla, hasta que un día, inadvertidamente, su pubis dona una pequeña ofrenda, y llega alguien que se inclina para mirarle a los ojos, que le habla de la vergüenza y de su especie, que le señala ese sabor amargo de ser hombre. Gracias, gracias. Bueno, uh, well, um, Angelo talked about, first of all, that. Uh, He wants, he's working right now on some uh, hybrid forms of turning um, uh, some of the poems into some musical uh, form, and it would be in English. And uh, well, hopefully he can uh, present it uh, here. Uh, then uh, he said he wants to go back in time a little bit and talk about his own childhood. And uh, when his uh, uh, desire was uh, emerging. And um, he was an altar boy. Um, and uh, he remembers uh, being uh, at church and wearing um, a white uh, uh, cassock, almost the same as uh, the priest, but white. And he was asking if Uh, that also happens in churches, uh, in American churches here. Uh, I, I have no idea. I haven't been to uh, American church in a long time. But so, but he would think about that um, cassock, that white cassock, 
as a uh, soil uh, dirty uh, because the the uh, um, the contrast be between what what he was being asked by the priest and what he was feeling himself and how that was affecting his uh, his white ca cassock. So the poem is called Catechesis. Look, for example, at the boy's mouth that sucks the nectar of a watermelon and offers you its gap-toothed smile. Watch the juice that drips onto the color of his white shirt, how the corners of his mouth stretch to the sweet and hidden taste of the fruit. And notice then that guilt does not splatter him yet, even though he may notice on his skin a wet and greasy brushing of the stain. He spends his life without naming it until one day, inadvertently, his pubis gives a little offering and someone comes who bends over to look into his eyes, who speaks to him about shame and his species, who points out to him the bitter taste of being a man. Muchas gracias, Orlando. Voy a, a leer dos poemas más. Bueno, puedo, ¿no? Pepa. <ríe> Yo miro a Pepa. <ríe> sí, vale. Voy a leer dos poemas más. Intento rápidamente. Uno que es más bien, eh, es un, más que un poema, un poco un manifiesto, ¿no? Es una, eh, es la pregunta que no tiene respuesta. Eh, la pregunta que no tiene respuesta que creo que tiene que ver mucho también con las teorías queer, ¿no? Que en muchos casos se tienden a, ¿no? a definir, a encerrar y per se es imposible hacerlo, ¿no? Eh, y, y voy a, a, esta, a, a la sección de caballeros ¿no? de, un, de una tienda, de un Zara, de una, de una cadena, porque toda mi vida, eh, bueno, gran parte de mi vida, eh, iba allí metafóricamente creyendo que todo lo que podía buscar lo podía encontrar en esta sección, evidentemente metafóricamente hablando. Pero luego te das cuenta, ¿no? Cuando te, te libera de, 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 este, de esta mentalidad, te das cuenta de, de cómo, de lo grande que es el deseo, lo grande que puede ser la identidad y de cómo realmente el mundo puede ser mucho más rico. Sin embargo, desde fuera siempre he sido percibido como un hombre. Entonces, otra cosa que me interesa mucho es dialogar con la tradición y romper con ella para poder reinterpretarla. Entonces, en ese poema en concreto, he cogido una, un poema, o bueno, una, la estructura de, de un poema de Ángel González, eh, sobre todo cuando dice, yo sé que existo porque tú me imaginas, que es una, son uno de, de los versos más famosos, ¿no? más relevantes de la literatura, de la poesía en español probablemente, eh, y lo he reinterpretado. Sección de caballeros. Yo soy hombre porque tú me nombras. Si tuviera un cuchillo, sin embargo, partiría mi cuerpo en dos como un pescado y cogería tu mano para llevarte a los lugares más fríos y más íntimos de mi interior. Te sorprendería ese corazón helado y hueco que imagina el calor de tus manos, ese, ese cuerpo de hombre muerto, aún por construir. Thank you. Uh, Angelo, um, he wants to read a couple of other poems, and uh, one of them has to do with the idea of uh, again, pursuing the question of uh, uh, identity and uh, remembering that when he would go to the, uh, to the store, to the clothing stores, he would 
always go to the gentleman's uh, section when he was a kid because he thought or he hoped that he would find whatever he needed, whatever item of clothing he needed in there. So um, this poem is, uh, in a sense, a remembrance of that. But also the fact that he uh, likes to take tradition and rework it or work it over. So he takes um, a line from a poet by uh, Angel Gonzalez, um, which is, I know I exist because you imagine me. So he takes that as a, as a basis, as an epigraph for his own poem, Gentleman's Section. I am a man because you name me. If I had a knife, however, I would open my body in two like a fish and grab your hand to take you to the coldest and most intimate places of my inside. Would it surprise you that frozen and empty heart that imagines the warmth of your hands? That body of a dead man still to be built Muchas gracias. Y ese también será un... Estoy trabajando sobre este texto para hibridarlo también. Con, de hecho, con un, con un chico, de, bueno, con un productor de Los Ángeles allí, de Estados Unidos. Así que estamos más cerca. <ríe> y voy a acabar con un poema... Bueno, yo, como podéis ver, mmm, poesía de amor, nada, ¿no? Pero... Eh, cuando le enseñé este libro a uno de mis mejores amigos, el poeta Ben Clark, que es un poeta que yo admiro muchísimo, además de ser amigo, me decía, Ángelo, me gusta mucho el libro, pero no tiene ningún, ningún poema de amor. Eso no puede ser. Tienes que escribir un poema de amor. Bueno, entonces escribí este poema para cerrar el libro, un poco como un reto, como respuesta a un reto de Ben. Eh, bueno, hay una cosa que me fascina que cuando estaba escribiendo este, este poema que yo no sabía, sé que debería saberlo porque probablemente en, en, en el colegio y en el instituto te dicen esas cosas, pero yo la verdad es que no lo sabía o sea, descubrí que el polvo que tenemos en casa el polvo cuando, cuando estás limpiando es parte, o sea, son escamas humanas o sea, es parte de nuestro cuerpo y me parece me pareció maravilloso. Entonces, a raíz de eso escribí un poema de amor. ¿vale? Entonces, lo más cercano a un poema de amor es esto. Pensar en las escamas que limpiamos con, el, con los productos de limpieza. No, y por qué realmente muchas veces me pongo las camisas, esa no, pero muchas veces pongo las camisas de mi pareja, de mi marido. ¿no? Eh, entonces, he pensado también, si yo le escribo un poema sobre el por qué uso su su ropa usada, ya tengo justificación para hacerlo siempre, porque tengo, tiene un, lo digo en un poema, así que también una, algo útil, ¿no? Y se llama ¿De por qué me pongo tus camisas usadas? Por si queda alguna duda. Y dice, la ropa que tú has usado me define más que las flores aterciopeladas de mis camisas. Cojo una de las tuyas de la boca de la lavadora antes de encenderla y la guardo en la penumbra del armario donde sé que jamás la encontrarás. Rescato tu camisa del peligro de no tenerte cerca y me introduzco en ella para estar por casa como si la ausencia se aliviara con la misma tela que antes sostuvo tu cuerpo. El polvo que habita la casa es, en su mayoría, escamas humanas. Y yo quiero que la muerte me sorprenda dentro de muchos años, después de haber llenado las esquinas oscuras de nuestros muebles con tu vida. En el fondo de los armarios se acumula lo animal y lo eterno, ese olor salvaje 
que llamamos hoy amor. Thank you, Angelo. Um, um, about the, the, the last poem uh, that uh, he read, Angelo says that he's also working on some um, hybrid form, including music, um, uh, with um, um, somebody from LA. So uh, somebody a little bit closer to us. I don't know uh, how close, but um, anyways. So the last poem he wrote, um, um, uh, he showed the poems to a friend of his, Ben Clark, And Ben liked the book, but he said, well, uh, the problem is that uh, there are no love poems in this book. You, you must write a love poem. So uh, he decided to write one. And also he uh, remembers that uh, he was surprised when he found out in school that the uh, house dust that, that we, we, we see every day is made up mostly of human uh, skin flakes. Uh, that um, was very interesting to him and he never forgot about that. So he wrote this poem, Why I Wear Your Worn Shirts, because sometimes when he wears his uh, husband's uh, used shirts, Uh, now, uh, um, it can be, the act can be justified because it has been um, perpetrated uh, in, a, in a poem. So there is no, need, uh, no way to argue against it. So, of why I wear your worn shirts. The clothes you have worn defines me more than the velvety flowers of my shirts. I take one of yours from the mouth of the washing machine before I turn it on and put it away in the darkness, darkness of the closet where I know you will never find it. I rescue your shirt from the danger of not having you nearby. And I enter into it to hang around the house as if the absence would ease up with the same fabric that held your body before. The dust that inhabits the house is mostly human skin flakes. And I want death to surprise me many years from now after having filled the dark corners of our furniture with your life. The back of the closets accumulates all that is animal and eternal. The savage scent that today we call love. Thank you very much, Angelo. Thank you, Orlando. Wonderful, wonderful poems, very powerful. Um, so happy to have you here today, Angelo. It's amazing. Then maybe someone wants to ask something to Angelo or we can just chat a little bit about the poems. Sure, yeah, I think we have time for a few questions. If there are any, you can feel free to unmute yourselves. I don't have any questions, but I'm just floored um, by the poems um, that he's written. So thank you for, for bringing him to us. Thank you so much for listening to it. <laughs> I'm very happy. <laughs> I'm very, very happy. Good, good. I have a sort of a technical, uh, not technical, but um, a question about this hybrid form that uh, Angelo is, is talking about. And he mentioned music, but I, I noticed in your, in your bio, and I didn't know this before, that you are also very interested in theater. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if uh, this reworking of this hybrid form would involve performance, some form of performance of the poems that you are. Well, working. actually, I, I've been working on. Yeah, well, I've been working on performance uh, on my previous books. Okay. So yeah, Adanonada, which is my first book, and Impure Acts. 
I created a sort of uh, performance. And so I now I want to move on and try to my attention on another form of art. I don't know why, but I can't stand inside a box. And each time I do anything, for example, regarding theater or performance, or I need to switch to another form of art. And I like doing that because normally when you, when you write poetry, you do it uh, on your own, you are all alone. But when you, when you are doing, for example, something which is performance, theater or music, you start opening your poetry to other people. So you start creating art, you start mm, mm, turning your poetry into something new and that something shared. So I, I do like the idea of literature as something hybrid and something shared with other people. Yeah. I had a question as well. Um, okay. We talk a lot about gender identity and that sort of thing in PAPA's um, advanced literature course um, and poetry. Is there um, a specific author or maybe even just like a moment in your life that made you want to start writing poetry or like a favorite style or author that really motivated you? Well, actually, thank you for the question. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. I do like Aileen Mines, for example. I, I remember reading her when I was, I don't know, 16, 17 years old. Um, actually, I watched one, a video on YouTube. And at my age, it was something, wow, someone who is reading poetry on a YouTube video. Oh, that's so strange. <laughs> um, and I, I think she's very, very important for me. And, I'd, and right now there is another author. I don't know how to pronounce his name very well. I'm, I'm sorry, but it's Billy Ray Belcourt, something like this from Canada. And I, he, yeah, his poetry is, was very, very significant for me. So I think those two, ref well, and of course Pasolini, Pasolini. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know why I'm talking about English references, but I also had Italian references, which um, Pasolini and a musician who is Franco Battiato, Franco Battiato. Um, I can't name any Spanish poet because I started studying Spanish and reading uh, in Spanish when I was 21, 22 years old. So I started very, very late. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, I have a question. Sure, go right ahead. Hi. Um, I would like to know about, because Angelo, you mentioned that you want to create songs of your poems. So do you have something in mind, like what, what kind or what type of song, like what type of music you, you will be prepared? Uh, yeah. And well, also, I, I would like to know if you want to be the singer. Yeah, yeah. But I think voice, uh, nowadays, I think of voice as an instrument. I mean, something that you can modulate, you can change, you can twist. So I can't sing. I really can't sing. If I want some someone to get angry, I usually sing. So <laughs> it's very annoying listening to me if I sing. But if I use my voice as an instrument, I think that so if I manipulate my voice, I think that I can get a good result. And as far as the genre is concerned, 
I I like to to investigate into um, electronic sounds and also pop sounds. I think it 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 can be interesting to to investigate not in, into classical music or classical sounds that normally are um, associated to poetry or to when you read something with a piano or something with a violin. So no, I, I'd like to go uh, to, to take another road. So I'd like to, I mean, electronic music, pop music, dance music. So. I don't know what's going what's going to happen, but I like to go the, that way. Thank you for such an interesting question. A quick question. Hi, I have a quick question. First of all, Angela, yeah. thank you so much for being here. You. Your the reading, and thank you, Orlando, for your wonderful translations. It's really great to have poet and translator here together, and. Um, just I want to reiterate what someone else said before that you're, I, I love your poetry. Thank you so much for sharing it. My question is quick. Did you start writing poetry in Italian? Have you, do you write in Italian or do you just write in Spanish? Have you thought of writing in English? Your English is quite good. Have you thought of writing in English or how is language, how is language a part of your, your poetic vision? Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, well, actually, I started writing when I was here in Spain, so I've never written anything in Italian. But when I write in Spanish, some words just pop out in in Italian, and so I I write them out and then I translate them. But just a couple of words in each poem. I don't know why. Um, I think that writing in Spanish, writing in a, in a um, foreign language, helps me to to deal with the content uh, uh, from a detached way. A bit, a, a bit more. I, I don't know if detached way. I don't know if you can understand me. If I can, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, like, like a ghost. So I'm out of myself writing about myself and i think it's an interesting point of view but i i'd like to i'd like to write in english yeah i'd like to do that i'd love to do that because i love english <laughs> so <laughs> but i never speak english so i'm very happy to do it right now because i can't speak english in my daily life <laughs> your english is very good thank you thank you for that answer okay. i appreciate it thank you so much I, I had a question too. Student first, then me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I know you mentioned YouTube earlier, but I was wondering if like any other social media platforms have like influenced your work. Hmm. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like reading poetry on Instagram. Well, you know, there are a lot of accounts of people reading on Instagram. But nowadays, uh, actually, I'm into the Kiki Ballroom scene. So I get inspired, I get more inspired by watching on Instagram people dancing book more than listening to people reading poetry. I think that voguing, I, 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 I mean, in, in the United States, I think it's widespread. But here in Spain, not that much. So I'm trying to. Well, yes, once more, it's like trying to transform the this dance, voguing, the the, the voguing scene into a um, political and uh, issue, and, and that can be the basis of writing poetry. So I would say that on Instagram, basically. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Well, I have to build on Kathy's I, question, actually. Um, when you were talking about sort of being a ghost, right? And like being mm -hmm. attached. So 
often people that are bilingual and I interact with many of them in my daily life in my career um, talk a lot about they almost feel like a different person when they're speaking in another language so do, do you feel as if you're almost a different person writing in Spanish than you would be writing in Italian or English yes yes Sarah I I feel like I'm another person and I, I think that the relationship that I have with languages is very similar to a relationship with a person. I, I remember that I got angry with English when I was 21, when I started dating <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> and now I'm, I'm, I'm going back and flirting with English once again. And it, it's very strange because even though, for example, Italian is my mother tongue, it's very, very difficult for me to, 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 to talk in, in Italian apart from saying, oh, the weather is fine. Oh, today I ate this or that with my mother. So um, maybe I wouldn't be able to, to express what I'm expressing right now in English or in Spanish in Italian because I, I think it's, it was just a, a trauma when, when I decided to leave Italy for political reasons, uh, because I was struggling in Italy. I was part of the political life. And I, and I realized that all I was doing was effortless. So I moved to Spain, which had another political environment. And I felt like I, I was home here so this uh, is reflects into the language and I, I i feel i'm part of it so i'm able to to write in spanish thank you that was beautiful you're welcome i think orlando had a comment that you wanted to share i actually wanted to ask a question to both of you, Orlando, and um, something that a point of contact has been a um, work for, for a long time, uh, uh, something that, that has been a very profound reflection and, and theme in, in many of our publications is the work of translation and translation in, in poetry, particularly, which is a very different kind of translation and, um, and, and there's this notion of the translator um, being a, also a poet and, and that the translated piece um, has a, somehow a life of its own um, that, that, um, that, that, that is translating the original poem but, but has um, something that detached that, that separates them and, and there are two different poems. Do you feel that in, uh, in the work that you've done together, working in the translation of the work from Spanish to English? Well, uh, I'm going to let uh, Angelo talk uh, more about that and later uh, David Lloyd, um, but uh, That's right. because it, it does feel when you look at the finished uh, product, it does look as something slightly different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, it has to be modified because there is no exact correspondence between the two languages. So I spent time, I spent more time with, uh, with David actually going back and forth and said, okay, will this fit? How, how does it? Because also I had to deal with something that was totally new to me, which was uh, dealing with, uh, uh, with the environment and with, with animals. So we talked quite a bit about that. And the same thing when I, when I work with uh, Aurora Luca, we write and said, well, what do you think about this? You know, it, it is different. Uh, I, and this is a good uh, opportunity to ask Angelo how much I have uh, changed transformed uh, uh, the poem, you know, you know, the old saying, Italian, uh, traduttore, traditori, that somehow you betray the, uh, 
the original intent of the piece, but I don't see any way around it because if you try to go literal, then it becomes a mess. So you really, we really have to go a, a different way. And in that way, I think it became, it becomes creative. But yeah. uh, Angelo, I don't know. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think that the translation is an is a form of is an art. So when you're translating poetry, you are writing poetry. Um, sometimes we we are not aware that when we are reading a book, we are reading a possible translation of a book. For example, when I read Kafka, I am not actually reading Kafka. I'm reading the translate one of the possible translation of Kafka. So I think that. Uh, the magic of translation is what Orlando did, for example, with my with my work, you know, it, giving his soul uh, to my poems, and I think that it it's the only possible way to to make a good translation, and this is why I think that Google Translator won't be able to <laughs> <laughs> translate poetry, translate literature, <laughs> never ever. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's a beautiful translation, and uh, we enjoyed that very much. Thank you, Orlando, for that work. And to answer you. your questions that you uh, posted, Angelo, I, uh, about the altar boys, I don't think there are many left in the United States. Um, okay. <laughs> you were uh, mentioning that. But the few ones that there are do wear white. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sara, do you want to say something? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, well, if there are no further questions, um, thank you, Angelo. This was an absolutely beautiful reading, an honor to have you with us this evening. Orlando, thank you for the incredible translations. Peppa, Kathy, Terry, for your hard work as the editors of this publication. If uh, you would like to pre-order Corresponding Voices Volume 14, which Angelo is featured in. You just need to visit our website. I will drop the link in the chat at puntopoint.org and click store and you can pre-order your copy. It will be out at the end of the month in celebration of National Poetry Month. Again, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, we will be back next with Arthur Flowers. Arthur Flowers, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Very beautiful. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. <laughs> oh, Angelo, un abrazo. Y espero que algún día podamos conversar cuando pase todo este. Y seguramente, <laughs> seguro. Preciosa, preciosa, preciosa lectura, Angelo. Sí, qué sí. bien, me alegro muchísimo. Perfecto. Porque... Perfecto. Porque muchas veces con las pantallas es muy difícil llegar. Sí, tú estabas hablando de que no te gusta.